Karen Lopez is um, a data knot. Um, I'm sure she will be able to tell you a little bit more about um, that in her talk. Um, but she's going to talk about managing your time so that it doesn't manage you. And especially during a hackathon, I think this is very relevant for everyone for this weekend, um, in general, in your daily lives, in, at work. Um, managing your time so that it doesn't manage you is something that's so important to all of us. Um, and um, so during this talk, Karen is going to share her experiences in mentoring and judging hackathons, including tips about what order to approach the challenge throughout the weekend. Um, so things like getting started, assigning roles, uh, deliverables, so things that need to get done no matter what, um, demos, using open data, just like we just heard Lisa talk about open source data, um, and the judging process, and then subject matter experts. These are all things that um, Lisa, or, I'm sorry, no, Lisa just spoke, um, that Karen's going to talk about in her talk. Um, we're just making sure that she is headed over. Um, just one second. All right, I think we just, gained one Karen Lopez. Um, hi, Karen, how are you? Hi there, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, so I just did, I heard that you were in the green room, so I just did uh, your quick introduction with the title of your talk and um, okay. what you would be talking about. And I did mention that you are a data knot, and I'm yeah. sure that um, we do have some people who either are watching now or will be watching the recording that are in interested a little bit in the mm -hmm. data knot. I'm kind of speaking for myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if, if you could um, maybe start out by introducing yourself and a little bit about that and what you do, that would be great. And okay. uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. And just one more thing. So um, I have. I have 30 minutes and I leave time for questions at the end. Is that how, or, and you help answer the questions if anyone's having any other issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me get my screen shared. Oh, hold on. Okay. I need like five screens. <laughs> I find myself doing that a lot too. <laughs> okay. See my screen okay? Yep. Okay, so I can start? Yep. This is perfect, perfect. Thank you all for joining us for this pre-hackathon symposium. I'm Karen Lopez. I am also a Space Apps Challenge Ambassador for the overall universal uh, global event, as well as I help with judging and I'm a NASA data knot. A NASA data knot is a program that was started by NASA. It was an offshoot of the Space Ops Challenge when uh, it was started when the CIO of NASA, as well as the people who were putting on the Space Ops Challenge, realized that there was an underrepresentation of certain types of people participating in the hackathons, some based on gender, some based on other unrepresented, un underrepresented peoples. So they started this NASA Data Knot program which right now is currently on hold as NASA is very busy with all the commercial crew things happen, plus the Artemis mission to go back to the moon, plus a lot of other things that are going on at NASA. But the program was an, a volunteer program. I'm a volunteer with NASA. I don't work there. Um, to help a group, a class of people who were new to NASA open data, to learn how to use it, as well as to learn how to code, to learn how to do data science, to learn how NASA data works. So there were two intakes a year of about 50 people from all over the globe who would attend a series of workshops on uh, every few weeks to learn about open data, to learn about data management, data literacy, to learn about rocket science math, to learn about planetary sciences and earth sciences and a whole bunch of things. And then teams of data knots would get together along with mentors like me 
and NASA data scientists and NASA engineers to build a project or to do research into the data or help develop metadata for the data, ontologies, all kinds of things. And that was a really interesting program. And so it is normally open to people of all skills, all types of data literacy. Um, it did have a focus on code, but it's not necessarily um, all about code. So we're going to go ahead and, and if you have questions about the Data Not program, you could go ahead and ask them in the Q&A or the chat, wherever you're putting your questions. And I'd also recommend that you get your questions in now. Don't save them to the end. I'll be answering them at the end, but please ask them along the way. So my talk is about um, how you should manage your time during the hackathon itself. But let's talk about it. My role, my role in my real job as a consulting company I own is I call myself data evangelist, sometimes a project manager. Um, but I'm thinking right now the project management parts of the issue. And that is you might think that your goal for this hackathon is to build the world's best software application with web architecture at web scale and to do the best coding and to do all that. And I'm here to tell you as both a judge in several hackathons, as well as a mentor, that that's only part of your goal. Because this is a hackathon, you'll need to prepare a pitch, almost like you were pitching for funding. But instead, you're preparing deliverables, a vision, an explanation, and lots of information in your submission in order that all that hard work you did could be judged by people who've never met you, may know nothing about the code language you're using, may know nothing about the frameworks or architectures that you're using. And the Space Apps Challenge website, and including the New York City one, but all of them include a lot of information about how you're supposed to do that. Your actual project, that is, building software, building UI, doing art, building an ontology, could consume so much of your time this weekend that you forget about the actual deliverables that you're supposed to provide. Remember, at the end of the weekend, you are delivering a project submission package. Yes, there might be software. Yes, there might be art. Yes, there might be demos. But it's the entire package you'll be judged on not just code and not just the anything that you build. It's often stressful all through the weekend as you realize you're running out of time or something you thought you could do, you can't get it done in such a short period of time. And the judges understand that. They understand that to build an incredible application or a perfect thing of art takes time. That's why they're gonna ask you a lot of questions about what is your vision? What is your mission? How would it work? How would people use it? What would the impact be? What cost benefits and risks would implementing your proposed solution or idea or concept or art, what would come with it? They're going to judge what you did over the weekend based on all of those things, not just the thing that you built. One of the biggest mistakes teams make is waiting to prepare all of that evidence, all of those deliverables until the last minute. And we're all like this. I am a professional procrastinator for certain. Um, but my biggest tip to you, and you're gonna hear me say this a lot during this presentation, is that um, you cannot wait to the end. You'll be tired if you're working on a team, maybe you're tired of talking to each other, you need to start submitting your results on the first hour you're working. That sounds crazy, but you can actually start writing some of your submission things very early in the weekend. So there's always a countdown at the end of the hackathon, always. And you'll be getting reminders and rocket chat and from your organizers that it's time to make sure you're submitting. Do not, do not ignore those reminders. And as a good project manager, 
I wanna tell you that you start with the end first. Start planning for what your deliverables are gonna be. Some of the challenges um, will make sense for you to have a demonstration that you have to prepare. So if you're using a screen recording tool or you're going to stand in front of your camera or use your phone, make sure you understand how to use those tools today because you don't want to be messing with how do I upload um, an iPhone video to Google instead of iCloud or how do I get the sound fixed on this video You'll want to understand those things now. Now, the demonstrations you do are really short. Um, I, I think they're 30 seconds. I mean, really short. If you go way over, no one will see the rest of your demonstration. So make sure that you understand all the submission guidelines. And there are facts and documents out on the Space Ops Challenge website to give you hints about that. Your deliverables, of course, will vary based on um, what sort of project you're doing. If you're building art, chances are you'll either submit the art digitally or a photo of it or a performance of it, one of those things. So it depends on what you're delivering will depend on what the format and the content of what you upload. Your project demo, because it's so short, if you're doing an application, you want to demo the things that will give judges the best understanding of your vision for what you've built. Not necessarily a lot of details about how it all works. You're really pitching this solution to people so that they understand, they understand it best according to the judging criteria, which is also available on the website. Um, you have to use the submission process in order to do these things. And so it's really important. I help with some of the judging in screening the submissions to make sure they're complete. And I can't tell you how many people I know worked really hard on their projects, but didn't get their submission completed. And that's all the judges are gonna have. So some tips about how judges look at your submissions. Completeness is really important. Don't skip questions. Um, if anything, if you think a question doesn't apply, then say you don't think it does it it doesn't apply to your project because this. But I'm here to tell you the judges are looking for your thoughts for every single question that they've asked you to answer in your submission. The other thing judges are going to look at is the challenges themselves list what the goal of the challenge is. So they're gonna look closely at your submissions, mostly at the words you provide on how well it fits the nature of the challenge. So even if you've built, built the most wonderful database-driven web scale architected solution, if you haven't met the, the sort of request of the challenge, then the judges aren't going to be able to give it a lot of points for that. So they're going to look at the completeness of your submission and how well your proposed solution and vision fits that challenge. They're also going to look at things like innovation and inspiration. And that means that if your submission looks a lot like an existing solution out there, they're going to want to know why is this different than something that's already in place. They're gonna look at the impact of your solution on society, locally. Um, I have a slide coming up just in a second about what that impact might be. And the other really important thing that a lot of people forget in their submission is there will be a question about what space open data did you use? The whole point of this hackathon in the Space Ops Challenge is to leverage NASA and the other nine space agencies open data in your solution. And not just as a little thing on the side, but it has to be core to what your solution is. Even the art challenge needs to have somehow leveraged NASA and the other space agency data and also other open resources they might have. So 
there's open code in some places, there are images. So not just numbers and letters, but you have to realize that open data might include sounds, might include videos, might include images. So those are all really important to consider. The submission form will ask you to list the open data you use. And then a good judge is gonna see, oh, I can see how that data appears or is utilized in the solution as you described it in your submission. So if you don't communicate that link between the data you used and what your submission is, the judge might miss that importance of it. So you literally have to show them in the part about the open data, how you used it. So I just went today and looked up what the global awards are gonna be. So there are things like best use of science, most inspirational, and then there are these new ones. I love these new ones. Best sport storytelling, the best way to connect people, the best art and technology and local impact award. So while you're thinking about how to solve the challenge, if your goal, not everyone's goal who participates in a hackathon is to win a global award, but if your goal is to compete at the global level for awards, make sure you understand what the awards are. Um, this best use of technology, that's really broad. Best use of data, really broad. So there's certain things that you could, words and ideas and goals and visions that you could put in your submission that would help judges understand, oh, that's a really great use of data. Oh, I can see how that would be a huge local impact on this. Um, so it's not, a ju the judging isn't is your coding style following an international standard? I mean, if you did that, put that in your submission, that makes it a stronger submission. But the awards are based on these criteria here. So <laughs> as a classic uh, NASA saying, failure is not an option. The other way to really hurt your chances in the hackathon is to not follow the rules. Now there are rules about conduct, very, very important. There are rules about when your submission has to be finalized. There are rules about how many people on your team. There are those sort of what I call administration rules, but there are also rules like you have to use open data and open resources in your solution. That's a rule. And if you don't do that, then your submission won't be passed along for uh, other judging levels. Make sure you answer, I'm just gonna keep saying this, make sure you answer all the questions completely. Another thing to do is that, you know, there might be answers or questions in there that you think are asking the same thing. Like what's the difference between your project vision and your project goals? Well, those are great questions. They aren't the same thing. If you feel like you just need to copy and paste the same answer in all the boxes, that's not going to help your submission. So if you don't understand the question, come into Rocket Chat to get help either from ambassadors or the subject matter experts to help understand what they're looking for in those questions. I also think it's really important. I mean, technically this is a competition, but I think it's important that you um, ensure that you enjoy your time. So if you're getting stressed, if you're getting tired, if one of your teammates has disappeared, just sort of let it float away in microgravity, come back to what your true goal, what you stated at the beginning was your goal. And your goals might change and your ideas might change and your vision might change, all okay. It's just, don't let that get you down. Come into chat ask a question. That's why we're here. So I did mention, I'll mention again, you must use open data and open resources from the space agencies that are participating. And there's my lovely Canadian Space Agency, just putting a shout out for them as well. So the most important thing is study the challenge, the details of the challenge, understand the nuances of what they might asking for. If you are participating, let's say in the ontology challenge, 
your deliverable needs to be ontological. It, it, it can't just be some code that kind of hints around what the challenge is. So I'm a data architect. I consider my job mostly data forensics. And I'm here to tell you that if you have a vision of an app you want to make, finding the data that's going to help you do that is going to take longer than you think. So after you've studied the submission form to understand what you're going to have to provide at the end of the weekend, now you're going to start looking for data. And you might need help finding data. You might find out that the data that you're for sure exists doesn't exist. Um, you might have to find it from other open data sources. So a, a question that comes up all the time is can I use like national or state or local government open data? Yes, you can, but you still have to use the space agency data as part of your solution. Understanding the data you find is gonna take you longer than you think as well, because you might not understand what each data item means. You might not understand that there are many ways of describing a location on a point on the earth. You might not understand that there are certain acronyms and terms and codes that are common to rocket science or planetary sciences that you don't understand. The way you can get help with that is there are often metadata documents, so documentation around the data to explain what it is, what its limits were. A lot of times there's not, but sometimes there is. And then you can also ask the subject matter experts in rocket chat but you'll want to start trying to get those answers earlier rather than in the middle of the night when the SMEs, subject matter experts, might all be sleeping. Um, data set owners in the challenges might not be available when you are to answer these questions. So we can help you with that, but we can't guarantee we can get those answers. So the sooner you get the questions is, the more likely you'll get an answer. And I also want you to remember that data is weird. 35 years I've been working as a data architect and I can tell you it's weird. So there was this news story a while ago about a 17 year old guy in the UK found flawed data on the ISS, on the space station. And he noticed with data that if an energy detector had no data, there was a negative reading recorded, a minus one, but you can't get negative energy. So it was a flaw. And the press reported that even NASA experts could not explain this. Well, I'm here to tell you that putting a negative number for missing data is very common in data sets rather than putting a zero. These are null values, null indicators. There was no energy reading. No energy reading is completely different than a zero energy reading. So I knew this story, the media got it. I mean, it was a great story, but the media probably didn't realize that a negative one usually means missing data, not negative one. So you'll run into these fun data facts as you work with the data. You need to budget time for understanding the data. Understanding the data is really important for your solution, what you're building to be correct. So I have a recommended process for you that you should start with finding the data and resources for your challenge, understand the data and ask questions from the subject matter experts, understand the submission questions, um, maybe even appoint a team member to be responsible for gathering that data during the whole time you're working. Um, assign responsibility to each team member to answer certain questions. Plan for how you're going to demo your project. This is even before you build it. Set time boxes for each phase of your project that says, like, for the next four hours, we're going to find data and understand it and understand how to access it and how to use it. And for the next two hours, we're gonna build screen uh, user experience mock-ups before we even build them. Like time box your stuff. If you get it done early, that's great. Have a break or start your next time box. 
Then once you've gathered all these resources, start your project. Develop your demo and answers as you go and submit your project, giving ample time to submit it in case there are issues. So you'll need to show how your solution works. You have to understand the tools you're gonna to use to record your demo and know how to use them before you start, really important. The other thing that mistake that a lot of teams make is you're gonna be required to upload your deliverables someplace on the internet that everyone can get to. And it's very common for teams to accidentally upload it to a site that needs registration or a login to get to. That's not going to work for the judges. It's not going to work for everybody else. So you need to test the links that you provide to the judges to make sure that they do not require a login. That might mean starting an incognito or in private browser session to get to the resources to make sure it doesn't have a login before it. People will reach out to you if your links aren't working or they're broken, but if you don't respond in time, then the judges won't have access to your deliverables and that will make it nearly impossible for them to judge your work. Use all the help that's provided to you. There's all these guides and frequently asked questions on the website. Um, make sure you meet all the criteria that you've time boxed and start your submission now and leave time to finalize it at the end. So ask your questions in Rocket, Tax, Rocket Chat. Ambassadors like me are here to help you. Make sure you've fully shown how your project would work. Um, make sure you fully expressed how you're meeting the challenge and then give yourself a great high five when you're done. So that's all I have. We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, I hope to get to meet you all on Rocket Chat. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, that was super informative, not only for space apps, but for hackathons and even real life in general. Um, <laughs> yeah, I use these tips in my own job. So yeah, um, I'm sitting here thinking about my last review and how some of these tips could come in handy now. <laughs> um, but uh, we did have some questions. Um, I know the answers to them, but I think they were geared towards you. Um, how many years uh, or how many times a year uh, does the hackathon run? And um, how do you put through an application? Um, and then what is the age range, if any? Are we talking about the hackathon? Or yeah, the, the, space, the space apps. I okay, think. for space apps. So normally it's once a year. I know last year there was a special COVID one because the space apps challenge was delayed or canceled. I don't know what the right word was. I think it was just delayed. Um, and I believe it's, so I know kids can participate, but I think only with a parent or guardian. Um, and the, uh, the, to sign up for a team or, and you can participate as an individual, you go to spaceappschallenge.org, right? Did I get it? Is it org, right? Yeah. Um, to go sign up for your team and you can sign up at, with your local event, even though it's all virtual this year, completely virtual. So there's no place to go for your local event, but you can also sign up for the universal challenge, which is part of the part I'm helping with primarily. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, it's um, they you can have uh, any ages. You're right. Um, uh, under 18 just has to have parental supervision. Yeah, and there are a lot of uh, kids that participate, even in the coding parts. But I especially love the times when kids have participated in the hardware challenges. Where yeah, they have to build something. That was really yeah, we had um, a couple of years back, we had, I think, a nine year old um, and she built a prototype of her. Um, it was to clear the ocean of pollution. Oh, nice. Um, it was like to catch things and a net type device. And she actually built it with like straws and things that she oh, found. Nice. And it was so amazing. So yeah, very much looking the, forward to it. At the Toronto Space Ops Challenge, we had a child and his father who made like a Canada arm that worked with his arm. And I thought oh, that was really cute. 
<laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. Someday, if I retire from being a mentor in this program, I'm going to try some art challenges because I like art and data together. I think that would be cool. Amazing. Yeah, I I do too. I I wish I was more creative. So I'm I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I'm going to have to get more into the creative challenges at some point, yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't see any other question. Oh, wait, we do have one Q and a, Oh, I love your username uh, from anonymous. <laughs> um, that was uh, the only other response that we had. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to not only, um, per, uh, present here today now and later um, yeah. but also um your dedication to space apps and and the nasa programs in general it's mm -hmm. it's ins inspirational to myself thank and you. i'm sure our participants so thank you so much yeah thank you have fun thank you